Hello and welcome to Naked Super Assembly live from Christian Brothers. Uh, sorry, from the Christian Brothers Grammar School in Oma. We are also joined by students today from Oma Academy, from Loretto Grammar School, and from Drumra Integrated College. Now, for daily, today's Super Assembly, we are going old school as we welcome back. Radio One DJ and podcast host Phil Tagger to his own school. Now, I know Phil is dealing with some overdue library books, but he will be on this stage very soon to tell us about how he deals with uh, opportunities, how he spots a good opportunity, how he deals with setbacks, and what happens when you sleep in. The only reason I'm back here is because I didn't do the detention like I was meant to in A-level. So they were like, right, you're coming back and you're doing this. It's been ages since I've been in this school. And it's been a little bit weird and a little bit trippy just coming back and walking around it, seeing everything has changed and like everything that hasn't. And seeing some of the teachers looking a bit more gray-haired and a bit older than they were <laughs> um, when we were here. And it's so weird to be back specifically in this um, I don't know if you call it a gymnasium or an auditorium or whatever you call it, but that door that's not even really there anymore, I almost sliced my little finger off on that door uh, when I was like second year. And our uh, principal at the time, Mr. Roddy Tierney, was standing right behind me because the principal's office is right there. And it's the only time I've ever, ever got away with swearing full on bad swear words in front of the principal because my finger was hanging off. So, I mean, it was worth it just to turn around and be able to do that in front of the principal. I mean, got sold back up, so it's all right. But yeah, it's, it is it's really, really strange because like, I didn't think that I'd be asked back to do something like this because, uh, I don't know, it just like, didn't really feel like it was a, a traditional career path that I was going down. And when I was at the school here, I was uh, a sort of, I don't know, average or below average. I'm sure there's some teachers down the back that could like, tell you exactly what sort of student I was when I was here. But I mean, I was, was never getting like, above a B or a C and like in most things. Actually, I think in my record of achievement, which I found today, I've dusted this down. This was specifically for you. I climbed into the roof space. In my record of achievement, do you still have these, by the way? No, it's all online, right? So you're like looking at this going, who's this granddad up on stage with this old record of achievement? And I was like, this is how bad I was doing. This is basically like what you send off to the universities, right? I've spelt French wrong. I've spelt it with three R's, and then if you flick back to the GCSE, French, grade D. So there you go. It's all there. Um, but like, the, way, the reason I'm here to speak to you is, is about um, sort of the opportunities and everything that sort of comes with the bit after leaving school. Like, I, I, I'll do a show on BBC Radio 1. I've been a DJ on Radio 1 for the last six years. I've been working in the BBC for about nine years. Um, I've like, started doing podcasts recently, and it's going quite well. Uh, I run a record label as well. And uh, yeah, I do loads and loads of different stuff. I DJ quite a lot at the weekends. I just basically don't sleep. Do you know, that's the sort of one. I just, like, I'm like one of those like, uh, sort of Dracula people that sleeps upside down for like an hour a night, gets a blood transfusion, and then goes back out at it again. But that's the one thing I sort of really want to talk to you about a lot, is, um, is sort of the hard work that you have to put in to like, get wherever you want to get to. And it's not like just Radio 1 or just whatever. Like, it's just hard work the whole way from start to beginning. Like in, in fourth year, um, I wasn't very good at, well, like from first to fourth year, I wasn't very good at paying attention at all. I never had any, never had any attention span. And to this day, I still don't. I've got like a, a little small red haired uh, producer who shouts at me when I'm on the radio going, Microphone! Microphone! Speak into it! Because I just completely forget where I am pretty much most of the time because I'm always just living in my own head. And the thing is, that's not a bad thing. Like, you know, being in your own head and dreaming those dreams is the reason why I, like, did a job that I loved and why I had the ambition and the enthusiasm to sort of, like, get to the next step. But from first to fourth year, it was quite difficult. Like, uh, when you do your fourth year exams, like they're kind of like the mocks that you do before your GCSE. I think everybody in here is fourth, fifth year now? Is it fourth or fifth year? Fifth, fifth right. Aye. So like when you do your fourth year ones, they're the kind of the ones that you don't really want to mess up that much. So when I did them, I got five days and had to come in two weeks before school started. So like in the middle of August. And I was just like, right, this is not going well. 
a fight, like because like you know, you're, it's kind of scared into you. If you don't get your English, or you don't get your math, or you don't get your science, you're not getting into uni. And if you don't get into uni, then you don't get the job you want. And if you don't get the job you want, then everything's screwed. And that's just not the case at all. Like I just worked hard, got fairly decent GCSEs, and then that was kind of. I didn't really fit in much at, at school as well. Like in like the early days, we had an absolutely in, insane year of people. Like. It was just like everybody was really loud. Everybody was kind of like in your face, and yeah, it was it was crazy. It was really hard to fit in because I liked I liked music and I liked sort of playing music and I liked listening to music and I was just basically obsessed with that. So the rest of the boys in our school, like they were they were really mad into their GA, and like it just wasn't for me. I played a bit of GA when I was growing up, and it's very very important to the Christian Brothers Grammar School. This GA, but I mean when you're just sitting with like. Like, I mean, my hair was pretty much the same as this guy in the front front rows, right? I'm guessing you like your music as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but like when you've when you've kind of got that, and all your peers just want to be out talking about GA, talking about football all the time, kind of makes it a bit hard for you to sort of fit in. So I used to hang about with the ones that were in the year below me, and yeah, that's how we sort of like bonded, got into music, started a band, and that's what we started a band here in school. And yeah, it was it was mad. Like it re really was mad because like, playing in the band was like our football, our GA, and that's where we were getting it. So it was like playing in that band that really sort of got me my confidence up for the first time. My confidence is one of those things that you might turn to the person beside you and go, "Flip, that person's really confident. That person knows exactly what they're talking about." If you strip everybody away to sort of base level, nobody's really that confident. Some people have outer confidence. And then maybe when they're by themselves, they might like have very low self-esteem. And some people just run into this world and can chat to anybody. Like I've got a mixture of both. Like I like talking to people, and I like putting myself in different situations with people. And I just find that like some people think you're massively confident, or to be able to go and talk on the radio and talk to like a couple of hundred thousand people a couple of days a week, they must be like you're well confident. I'm like. But yeah, like I, to a certain degree, yeah. But I just like I really enjoy what I do. The same way that somebody steps out in a football field and you're like, right, well, how are you managing to play in Croke Park in the All Ireland final? You're like, because that's what you love, what you do. You're not really genuinely thinking about the hundred thousand people listening to you or or watching you or whatever. You're just doing what you love doing. And it's all about like taking those sort of opportunities because I, I I reckon like any job that you want really is, is possible. And I really don't like this idea of people saying, oh, I'm from Oma, I'm from Northern Ireland. I, I, I can't do that because of where I'm from. That, that, to me, is the most defeatist attitude in the world. It doesn't matter where you're from, everybody's from somewhere. Like, fair enough, some people have that like in their life where maybe they've got a, a dad or an uncle or there's some nepotism that helps them get places. But, if you believe in what you do, and you believe in yourself, and you work really hard to get to where you want to be, then you will get there, regardless of being from like, like the Congo, or, or being from Oma, or being from Kesh, or maybe Lack. But do you know what I mean? Like you, you can literally do whatever it is you want to do. And I find that like, quite, quite um, inspiring, seeing people from around like Oma, like, uh, footballers, people in the media and stuff going and getting those jobs. I just found that absolutely amazing. Because when I left school, I went to um, the University of Ulster in Coleraine, and I didn't have that much inspiration at that uni. I kind of hated going to uni. Like, a lot of people will say to you, like, going, oh, man, uni's, uni's amazing. Like, you know, that's where you're going to make the best times of your life. I didn't enjoy uni one bit. Because again, kind of like when I was at school, I was hanging about with a load of people that I had no interest. We didn't, have, didn't share the same interests. There was nowhere to go to gigs up in Coleraine or whatever. So I moved to Belfast. And as soon as I started hanging about with people that had the same sort of inspirations as me, that wanted to play in bands, that were out at gigs, that wanted to be DJing, that wanted to be sitting in coffee shops or pubs or whatever, talking about music to the little hours in the morning, that's when I got really inspired. And I guess from there and from doing that and talking about music and writing about music, I started writing uh, for a magazine when I was about 18 years old, I was doing like reviews of albums, um, and that's kind of how I got to doing the radio because, like, 
it's a question that's been asked a few times, because they're like, how, how did an Egypt like you end up on the radio? And I'm like, uh, well, I got there because I was on the dole. I, I swear to God, I went from the dole straight to Radio 1. I was in the band for like two years. And when I was in the band, like, you want to make a full go of it. So it wasn't like, oh, I'll do this job on the side for money. Like, we were getting paid 45 quid a week from the Dole office for about two years to go around, do other things bands do, go on tour, um, play gigs up and down around the country, play festivals. It was brilliant. It was amazing. We never earned a penny out of it. We lost money the whole time. We came back more skint than we were, and that's saying a lot when you're not earning any money at all. And I came back from a tour once, and you come back after like about 10 or 11 days away, and you're tired, and all you want to do is just get into your own bed, and you see all the letters down in front of you, and one of them was said, we're going to we're, come into the dual office, we're going to shut, I don't, it wasn't exactly worded this way, but it was like, we're shutting off your money unless you get a job. And I was like, I don't want money anyway. <laughs> um, so I walked in, and they were like, right, well, we, we can get you a job on the site. And I was like, I mean, take a look at me. Do I look like I could even lift a brick? So I was like, that's not, that's not even remotely happening. Um, so they put me in a, a, a course for like three months, which was like a media studies course. And I thought, right, well, I've done media studies already at uni. I can, I can go and do this. And from that, they, I got into the BBC as a, a tea boy. So like, that's about 22 or whatever. I got in as a tea boy. And it was, it was mad because like, I, I never had any ambition to speak on the radio. I didn't, have the, I didn't have the personal confidence to be able to sit behind a microphone. Or I didn't have that sort of like, level of arrogance to think that people wanted to hear me talk about records or any of the rest of it. So when I was in, three weeks in, the, the, the main guy, the presenter fella, had to get his tonsils out. And the, the producer came over to me and was like, listen, we want you to do the radio show. And I can't exactly say what I said to him because uh, we'll get pulled off air. But it was basically of the, it was basically hit me going, absolutely not. <laughs> so he drove over to the house, he got me, got me in to do it, and I, I did the show and I really, really enjoyed it. For the first time I was like, this is exactly what I'm meant to be doing. And I had that sort of road to Damascus moment where I was like, this is the bit. So I went, I worked nine to five then after that, they gave me a job to sort of keep me about. I was doing paperwork and like making the tea and bringing guests up. You know the guy who, who shouts, it's Christmas, really loudly at Christmas? I remember bringing him up to the office once, and I was like, right, well, this is my job now. I, I bring like old rock stars up. So I spent every single day for about a year after that in the studio after my work finished at five o'clock doing fake radio shows to nobody. So I, like, it's the same way if you, if you play, I hate to use the football analogy the whole time, but it's basically staying after practice and just booting the ball against the wall and getting better. Because I knew that I wanted to do that then. So I was like, right, well, I want to be on Radio 1. And I was like, how do I get there? They're not going to just give me a job for the sake of it. So I was like, right, every day after work, stay for an extra three, four hours, make up a radio show, record a radio show, and then do nothing with it. Like it was, people would have thought I was absolutely insane because like, I'm just doing fake radio shows and it doesn't have one listener. But I did it for six months, and then I got good enough to the point where I thought, right, do you know what, I'll send them off a demo. And I sent them off a demo, and they were like, brilliant, can you come over and do a, a pilot, which is like a sort of tryout before you go on air? And I was like, no, I'm skint and I'm in Northern Ireland. And they were like, fine, so we'll try you out on air. So they brought me over and put me on Saturday afternoon to about four million people after having maybe done a couple of radio shows. I can't tell you how frightened I was. Because <laughs> being from Northern Ireland, everybody's like, speak slowly, they'll not understand your accent. So like two minutes before um, I was meant to go on, I went to the shop to get a drink. And the woman behind the counter couldn't understand my accent. And I was like, I'm about to go and speak to three million people here and nobody can understand a word I'm saying. I don't know what's going on. So they, I, think I managed to blag it through, and they, they gave me a job, and I, I worked at, I've been working at Radio 1 ever since. But I didn't know that that's kind of what I wanted to, to do at all. Like, I think it's important that you don't judge yourself against the person who's sitting beside you, because everybody is on a different timeline when it comes to 
when it comes to their lives, and not just like your career lives, but your life. Some people get married at 23, some people get married at 40, some people have babies at 17, some people have babies at 47. Do you know what I mean? But like in terms of careers, uh, like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I felt lost. I genuinely felt lost after, or well, it was at uni and after, like from 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and I hit, started hitting the radio at 23. And I was just like, it's not going to happen. I used to work in off licenses down here, and I moved up to Belfast, and I couldn't get a job in an off license up there. So I was like, I can't even get into a job that I was doing here. And I, I felt really low. Like, you know, you just think, well, where's, what, what, where's it going? And then I was home one time, right? And I was like going through like old photos for something. And I like looked at this old school, like, like how old does that look? It makes me look like I was born in the 1940s. Um, I was going through this, and it turns out like, I kind of did know, but I, for, I must have forgot about it because I was looking at the end of my personal statement. And it just said, my main ambition in life is to get a prestigious college, University of Ulster and Coleraine, right? Prestigious, right? And uh, study media studies and then pursue my career in the media world. And that blew my head because I never thought I knew what I wanted to do at all in the slightest. So to go back and read that and go, I don't know what got lost in those years, but it was, it was a bit mad. But Another thing I guess I think it's really important to talk to, and I don't know if your like, teachers talk to you about it or anybody talks to you about it, but is about like, t t taking risks and taking, like, making those opportunities happen for you. And, and the, the, the concept of rejection and the concept of failure, because like, we're all in the school system. I'll say we. <laughs> I haven't been for an awful long time, but you're all in the school system. And you know, like the onus is on you to like get good grades for your GCSEs and get your A's and your B's and get your good grades and your AS levels and your A levels. You're going to find so much hurdles like over the years that aren't just exams, and some of you are, are aren't going to do well, and that's totally fine. Like the the idea of trying something and trying your best at it, and it not working out for you is absolutely fine. Like. People think, oh, I've, I failed. I hate the word failed. You've, you haven't really failed. You tried something, it didn't work out for you. And when something like that doesn't work out for you, your mind kind of changes a little bit. You're like going, right, well, maybe that's not the thing for me. Maybe the thing for me is something else. And it kind of changes you off into sort of some different direction. When I was doing the, when I was starting out my record label, I've been running a record label for four years. I've released about 15 or 16 releases on it, like uh, EPs, singles from musicians like all around the UK. And every single time in those 15, and I've got one out at the minute, I mess up. I've messed up records not being able to come out on time. I've messed up with things not going out online. I've messed up. It's, it's how you bounce back from messing up. Like, you all probably watch UFC. Right? You all probably watch McGregor get knocked down and he, he, he gets back up and he's like, right, the only time he's ever humbled is when he's beat. But it's the same as anything. If you, get, if you get knocked down, it's the old tradition, you get knocked down, you come back up again. But it's like, I just hate people going, oh, I failed. You didn't. Like, you tried. And you'll find, true failure as well, you'll find out the bits that you like more and then you'll put more of your time and more of your onus on whatever that is. Like with me, it's radio, with me, it's music, but with you, it might be, might be science, it might be math, it might be performing arts, it might be music. Like, you don't really know where it's going to go. And I mean, you've got your GCSEs, what, coming, what, like, in a, what, a couple of months, I'm sure you've got some in January, you've got some in May. It's, it's a really hard time of your life, like, like the, the, the most stressful time I had not even at school and uni was the GCSE time. And it got easier actually after that. So like you're, you're in, you're kind of in the eye of it at the minute, but you'll all come out stronger for it. And you're all at good schools here as well. We've got like integrated, the convent, Christian Brothers um, Academy here as well. So like, you know, these are all at deadly schools. Um, so I kind of moving on from that sort of, uh, the concept of failure is that of like anxiety, right? So like. When it came to about AS level time, no, it was A level time, I was doing my last ever um, English, yeah, I think it was my English literature exam, 
And I was like, I was like told that I was going to, like, you know when they do this sort of, you're going to get the grades beforehand, and they said they were going to give me an A. But obviously you have to go and do it as well. So I went and did it. I was sitting in the, sitting down in the other, the sports hall down there. I could just feel my head starting to get really hot and my breathing was starting to get really faint. And I was like, I was like what's going on? I don't feel well. I had a full blown panic attack. Um, I had to like just leg it out of the room and just sort of sit outside breathing. I didn't even know it was a panic attack. And that was something I suffered from for a long, long time. And like anxiety is something I've had forever. Like it's never really gone away. I just know how to deal with it better than I ever did. And I think like, People must think that I'm mad going, how can you speak on the radio to 100,000 people? How can you go on TV uh, and do this? How can you step up on a stage and DJ when you've got anxiety and panic attacks? All I'm going to say is like, your enthusiasm and your love for something can beat any physical or mental ailment that you've got. And I think at my time when I was at school, I, we, we, didn't, I didn't, we didn't speak about anxiety. We didn't speak about mental health. We didn't speak about panic attacks or depression or, or any of the rest of it. And things have moved along so far uh, in the last few years, and especially in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's like really, really, um, it's really a big deal to, like, to talk about these things, because the thing is, everybody at some point in their life will have an affliction like this. And it's really important, not for just your progression in life, but just for yourself, like to be able to talk to somebody. And I'm sure you've got great people in the school that you can talk to about it as well. And, you know, just get the right help that you need too. Because like, I, I just like blew my mind that I didn't, we didn't really talk about it, not even just in the school, but outside the school as well, back then. And I just wanted to sort of talk about that a little bit. Um, also, so we've talked about the, the, the record of achievement. Um, oh, I so I when, when we moved to we moved to Radio One, um, the first the first day was probably like the worst day that I've had at it. If anybody's ever seen the film Pulp Fiction, if anybody's ever seen like Kill Bill, do you know who Quentin Tarantino is? Before I start, right, I've got a couple of nods down here. Which was, yeah, you do. All right, cool. So the the first the first ever day, of Radio One, you know. Got get me nice, get me nice shoes on. You gotta get, get, get everything perfect, right? It's gonna be brilliant. The first interview that I had to do in Radio One was with the one and only Mr. Quentin Tarantino. Now, a week beforehand, he had done an interview on Channel Four with Krishnaguru Murphy, and he had shut him down so fast. I mean, if you can remember that video or that interview. He asks a question to him, and Quentin Tarantino does not suffer fools gladly. He just ends him, like absolutely ends him. He asks this really stupid question. Quentin Tarantino basically just like throws him down and stands on him. And I'm like, I'm doing a show with a girl called Alice at this stage. And I'm reading this, I'm watching this, sorry, and I'm like, why is this our first interview? Could you not have like tossed me some old band that are just happy to be there? Be like, oh yeah, and our album's out here, and it's gonna be great. I'm like, why have you given us like the hardest person in the world to interview? So I was, I was freaking out about it, right? I was like, right, I'm gonna spend all day um, studying for this. I'm gonna like put so much research in. He was gonna be the next day. So I, I spent from nine o'clock till about eight o'clock that day, writing down questions, watching his movies, researching, researching, researching. And then I went home and I was still panicking about it. So like, you know, when you're like, studying for a test or whatever, um, the next morning, and you're you're in your bed, and you've got like every like all your notes just all around you, and you're like going right. I need to learn that bit, that bit, and that bit. I fell asleep about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, with notes everywhere, and forgot to set my alarm. So I I got a phone call at like ten to eleven from my producer going, "Here, where are you?" I'm like, "Oh Jesus, I've slept in, I've slept in for my first first ever interview, and it was with Quentin Tarantino." So I like I. I I, I managed to like leg it as fast as I could um, into uh, Radio One. It took me about 40 minutes because it's in London. Like it takes ages to get anywhere. Land in, covered in sweat, and Alice, who I was doing the, the co-host with, is mid the interview, and I come, come in like, ev like everything all over the place, going, "Sorry, sorry, sorry, I'm late." And they all turn to me and look at me, and they're like, "Oh, we like my, the producer had told them I was sick," and I was like, "Yeah, really sick." Fine, keep on going. I just went back to my desk. 
and just went like this. <laughs> Literally, the big boss walks right up behind me. The guy who hired me just puts his hand on the back, goes, good start. <laughs> and it was like, oh, no. But no, it, was all, it, got, it got a lot better um, from there. And yeah, like, it's just it's been a, it's, it's a privilege to work at such a station because I get to play... And I get, like, my job essentially is to find new bands and new artists and play them and give them their first ever play. So, like, you know, people like Wolf Alice, Royal Blood, Slaves in 1975, years and years, like, bands like that, I'm sure, sure you've heard of. Like, it was our job to find them, play them at the very, very beginning, do their first ever interviews. Like, I remember, like, Royal Blood, and I remember London Grammar coming in and them being really nervous and seeing these, like, proper massive artists at that very beginning stage of their career is absolutely amazing. So that's, that's kind of it for me. I've kind of like rambled my way uh, through a lot of stuff there, a lot of stuff and nothing <laughs> at, the, at the same time. Um, so we're going to shout out to um, some questions now, of I think. Course. Can I get a round of applause for Phil? <laughs> <I'm done. coughs> so our first question is from Oren, and he's from Christian Brothers. Hi, Phil. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what advice would you give to a new band or artist trying to get discovered? There's, there's so many different ways to get discovered now. It's, it's almost impossible to sort of like, um, stay, stay on top of it all. I think the, the best thing for a band at the very, very beginning is to go away and write as much music as you can and get it up to a certain level before putting it online. First thing that most bands do, they go, Oh, I, we've just wrote our first song. Our first song's lethal. And then stick it up on SoundCloud. And it's kind of not lethal, do you know? They're just so excited and so proud of what they've done that they want to share it straight away. The smart bands go away and write 10 songs and don't put anything online. And then pick the one good, really, really good one from that and then put it online. Because the thing about putting something, say a video of yourself playing in top of the town in Oma or uh, whatever. If you put, your, put a video of yourself in, in top of the town and it's your first ever gig and you look a bit, bit ropey, then that's, that'll live there for until whoever it is deletes it. It's better just to get everything ready and prepare. And that's not even just with being in a band. That's like the same with getting into the radio. It was all about preparing and making sure that the demo was right and making sure you knew the right people to send it to and making those connections as well. And I mean, if you're in a band in Oma, you just, just be friends with Henry Hughes. There you go. Who's Henry Hughes? Huh? Who's Henry Hughes? He's a local legend. All oh, right, OK. Um, so our next question is uh, Ella from Loretto College. Um, what's the best way to gain contacts and make a name for yourself? In, in like, radio? Yeah. Mm. I find, like, when, when I was 18, I got a lot of contacts through, like, a small magazine that I was, um, I was writing for. Because it, it, it's almost impossible to walk straight into the BBC and go, here, go and stick me on, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it, I wish it was that easy. And to be honest, if you heard some, some of the presenters. <laughs> but I think like, starting off and working for like, small magazines and, and university, like if you go to Queen's, you, you can do like, a, a show on Queen's radio. If you want to do some writing, you can do it. It's better to start small, right? Because there'll be people at those, um, stations or those magazines or whatever it is you want to do that will also know people at the next step and the next step. So like you can learn your trade in a pressure free environment instead of going straight into like a really high pressure environment where you can't get it wrong on air. It's better to learn um, slowly than throw yourself in the deep end. I mean, I did throw myself in the deep end a wee bit like, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody. And it took a lot out of me as well, like to be honest. Like, Okay, so next question is from Adam from Oma Academy, it's there. Um, just wanted to know what's the best piece of advice you've been given for your career? That's, really, that's, a, that's a really hard one. It's the best piece of advice that I've ever been given. You know, I've been given, I've actually heard this from a few different people, um, and it kind of works in every, every stage of every career, is it's not worded this way, I'm sure you can figure it out. Just be nice to everybody, right? As in like, don't be, even if you think that you're the best person in the room, or you, you might be, there's no room for egos, there's no room for arrogance, there's no room for any of that. If you walk into a working environment, everybody's there to do the job, and everybody's there, they want to feel good about themselves. Like, there's no room for people walking in, thinking they're amazing, and going, 
here, uh, why don't you do that, or, be, or being mean to people. I mean, I think like being from Northern Ireland is good, like, because we, we don't let people get egos here. Once you start acting up, like, you're cut down the size, do you know? But I mean, just be, be nice to everybody, and yeah, that's it. That's a, it's such a cop-out piece of advice, but it really works, like. Brilliant. So our next question is from Faith. She's from Drumra Integrated. Just think over there. What opportunities have you been offered working as a radio presenter? The opportunities, I like some of the best opportunities that I've got from in the being in the radio, has been like my favourite out of all of it is being able to meet artists that I love. Being able to play their music is a privilege. I, I'm like in a, a lucky position where I get to play music that I really, really like, and I get to pick. Um, and that, that feels good initially, because when, when you're making a radio show and you're playing the records that you want to pick, it really feels like your own show. But like getting to meet those people and getting to go to loads of, getting to go, go to loads of festivals for work, do you know what I mean? It's, not, it's hardly work when you're standing on a big weekend or Glastonbury or something like that. It makes, makes it feel like it's the best job in the world then. Okay, so our next question is from Jordan. He's from Christian Brothers. Were there any times in your career that you might have to change career paths? I yeah, absolutely. Like uh, I think so many times. Like even the, like I know that this is called the Make It um, Super Assembly, but I like I disagree with the the the, the concept of making it because I I, <laughs> I don't think I've ever sat down once and gone, hey, well done, kid, you made it. Do you know what I, like? I think like with, with the career or whatever, you, you can't, everything's really fluid, it, like, it changes, it's all different like year on year, like as you, get, as you get older you get better at certain things, and especially when starting out actually, when I was starting out there was loads of times I thought I'm never going to make it to, to Radio 1 or I'm never going to make it as, like uh, when I started doing TV for the first time, I messed up so bad. Um, I was like, well, I'm never going to be asked to do TV again. Um, when I've like started the record label, <laughs> I messed up so bad. Going, I, I basically have like screwed up more times than <laughs> I probably should have. So there's been loads of times where I thought it mightn't work out, and like I just, I still have that at the at the back of my head. And I think it's healthy to a certain degree to have that kind of at the back of your head. Going, I'm still really lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Okay, so we've got a question in from Facebook. Uh, David on Facebook says, what's the scariest thing you've ever done? The scariest thing I've ever done is coming back to me old school <laughs> after 13 years and stand up here. Like, the, like last time I was in this school, I was probably running about with Lynx Africa on, eating sausage rolls. Um, I, the scariest thing I've ever done... The scariest thing I ever done was the first radio show, the first live one. Because like the, the first one I did was completely faked. We, we, we pre-recorded it. It was a two-hour show, and it took about 10 hours to do it, because I kept messing it up and having to try it again. So they, they stuck me on. They were like, right, you're going on live. I must have ran out to the bathroom about 10 times before it started, and I brought a wee bucket with me to put underneath the desk in case I was sick um, while it was happening, because the nerves were just insane and the nerves don't leave you as well they just they dull down a wee bit or, or there can be the odd sunday where you've maybe like been, been out the night before and you're coming in you're like going oh god <laughs> but um no apart from that the first radio show was definitely terrifying but how do you deal with your nerves i really i think well. i think nerves are are like, i mean from somebody who's got anxiety you, like you, you can't yeah you, you don't confuse anxiety and um Butterflies, you know, like there's just good nerves and there's bad nerves. The bad nerves are the ones where you're standing in a queue at the post office and you think the world's going to end for no reason. You're just like, oh god. Uh, and then there's the good nerves going like, right, I can't wait to do this. This is going to be amazing. What if I mess it up? No, it's fine. Because if you're thinking, if you're thinking like that and you're, you're nervous going into it, it means you care and it means you've got adrenaline. So if you if you care and you've got like the adrenaline, it means you're going to be better at doing what you're doing. So the nerves actually make you better at what you do. If you went into like something like a really high pressure place and didn't have any nerves at all, I'd be worried. That's what psychopaths are like, you know. So um, Paula from Drumra asked, what skills or qualifications or things um, would be useful to get into kind of your career path? Into, into radio, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I things do you need to build up? Even, even I actually really think that like English was really important because mm -hmm. um, being able, like, be, you be, you learn to express yourself better 
the more you read and the, the more you pay attention to, to things like that, the more you write and the more you read, the better you will be at communicating. And if you want to be a, a radio presenter or if you want to like, make podcasts, you have to learn to be able to get what you want to say across very easily and very succinctly. And obviously, basically the opposite of what I just did for about 20 minutes. Um, but I think, like, yeah, being, being able to like read a lot and being able to like think about language and think about and like listen to other people and think about how they do it and how you would do it in your own sort of way, I guess. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So um, we've got one, time for one more question, and that's Fernando from Christian Brothers. Um, what would you say is the hardest part of your job? Um, because I do like a load of different things, like uh, the like the record label, the podcast. I'm writing a book at the minute. I've written 18 chapters of a book that's coming out. It's going to be plug on the BBC, isn't it, for my book? Is that is that allowed? Eh? Um, uh, I'm writing a book, a podcast, um, record label. Like I'm doing a load of different stuff, and I guess the the hardest bit is like I take too much on all the time, and I end up getting really stressed. And sometimes I'll just be so stressed. I'm like I turn my phone off. I'm turning my emails off. Because like you do sometimes end up working six, seven days a week, and that's not healthy. Like there, there's there's healthy, there's working hard in a healthy way, and there's working hard in a not healthy way. And sometimes, if you start and because I'm freelance as well, I don't do a nine to five. I might get up and start working at ten, or whatever. But I can sometimes still be working at ten that night or eleven that night, or go into a gig then after that as well. So I think like looking after your time management and all is probably the, the scariest thing, when, especially when you've got about six projects and you've got a load of angry people going, my, lab, my record's not coming out right, or you need to be doing this, that, and the other. It gets it on top of you sometimes, and you're like going, right, I need to breathe. Perfect. So um, that's all we have time for, for this super assembly. Um, I think before Phil's dragged off to the headmaster's office, I just want to say that this broadcast will be available to watch this evening on the Make It website, alongside lots of other resources to help make sense of the world of work and help you be the best you can be. So go to bbc.co.uk slash make it, or if you're like everyone else, just search for BBC Make It. Um, thank you very much to all the staff and pupils here at Christian Brothers Grammar School in Oma, and of course to Phil Taggart. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thanks.